Trust is a decision that someone else makes about you. From there, you make the decision, should we actually enter into this business when you're willing to see what you can and cannot produce? Can I pull apart one smaller skill that I can behaviorally practice? If these change, it will change the final price point. Maui Mastermind presents the Business Coach Podcast, answering your questions and providing real, actionable insights for building a better, stronger, more profitable business without sacrificing your time, life, or freedom anymore. Well, welcome to this episode of the Business Coach. What I want to talk about in this episode is how can you manage effectively complicated long-term business relationships and do it where you can gracefully find ways to, to build and to literally manufacture trust to make those relationships work? Um, as we start off talking, we're going to go through a really detailed, complicated case study. It's going to be of a particular engineering manufacturing company that worked with their key sales channel. But the same thing will apply whether you're doing work with people who work for you in the business or suppliers of yours or customers of yours. When you have relationships that last over time, managing what we'll call the accountability loop is an incredibly important skill. And when you master it, which we'll go through here today, you'll be able to give yourself and your company so many more opportunities. And you'll become someone who becomes irreplaceable in the context of the business world because it's so rare. Now, as I start off with what I was sharing, where this originally came from, I was having a wonderful conversation with my co-author of Build a Business, Not a Job, Stephanie Harkness. Now, Stephanie is probably one of the smartest business thinkers that I know. She is just a phenomenal businesswoman, has built multiple companies, um, had her major exit from her manufacturing business, um, which she sold, oh gosh, now it's going on probably six or seven years now. She was a client initially um, 20 years ago. She was a client for about six or seven years before she reached the point where she was literally owning a level three business. She was taking off three to four weeks every quarter to go on these fabulous trips. Her staff was continuing to grow the business until eventually they decided to exit and retire. Um, and they've done that with incredible grace and excitement. I mean, her and her husband, Jack, are just two truly quality human beings. But we were talking, she was, she was bringing up a subject she wanted to teach at one of the workshops that we host, our big Maui event out <clears throat> every year in Hawaii which we've been doing now for 20 plus years. And originally was how she got to, to know us, right? That's how we first met her. She became a client coming as an attendee to that event. And she shared something, a body of how she and her business life had created a framework to manufacture trust. She called it reliability, but really it's trust is what she was talking about. And what was interesting, as she described this body of a framework for how to manufacture trust or reliability, what was interesting was that in parallel, I realized, and we had discussed and had a great conversation about how I had come to the exact same conclusions with different languaging, but the same way that's been so useful in my business career, helping me scale companies and um, work with some pretty extraordinary businesses, helping them go from in the tens of millions to the hundreds of millions of dollars. And even now, a couple of our clients are right on the verge of billion dollar companies. And in terms of doing this, this accountability loop that I want to share with you in this episode is so critical. Now, a couple ways to think about that. So what does it mean to, to manufacture trust? Like, how, how does somebody even come up with the idea that I can trust this other person? In the world, human beings are wired to learn by something they call inductive logic. Now, inductive logic is a fancy thing and a fancy way of saying, but basically what happens is, here we are as a person, and I have an experience. And that from that sliver of experience, I generalize out what that means. So as a human being, I have this sliver of experience, and I, I make that mean a lot. So one way to build trust, and the most simple way of thinking about building trust, and and trust is the engine, it's the lubricant, it's the currency of what makes complicated long-term relationships in the business world work. There's no relationship in the, well, in any part of the world, but certainly in the business world, which is the context of, of this um, show, there's no relationship 
that isn't better, work smarter, more impact, more successful for having trust. Right? Uh, trust will help all of those things. But the way we manufacture trust is, at the most basic level, is we make a promise. And we keep a promise. That's literally how we manufacture trust. And, and so it can be as simple in, in, in a way of saying to uh, Jody, who is one of your suppliers, and you say, Jody, by the end of business today, I'll get you the formal purchase order for us to go ahead and make that purchase. And then I don't just have to make the promise and keep the promise, right? It's one thing to send that purchase order, but I have to close that accountability loop and say, hey, Jody, as promised, here is that purchase order for you. Sometimes we, we make a promise, we keep a promise, but the other person doesn't know that we've kept it. Sometimes we make a promise, but we don't keep it, and it hurts us. Or sometimes we don't even realize that we're making a promise where the other person perceives it as that you've made this promise. We call that a phantom promise. So inductive logic says people take small slivers of experience and generalize them out. Now, why does this matter? Because in the business world, to make long-term relationships work, you need trust. And trust is not, well, let's think about what trust is. Trust is not something that you internally are or aren't. I'm a trustworthy person. We're not talking about a quality or a characteristic or a value. We're talking about trust as a, a judgment, a determination that some other person makes about you and your company. When they say, I can trust you, they're saying you're reliable. I can count on you to deliver what you promised. I can count on you to keep your word. I can count on you to do the right thing. That's what trust is. Now, the challenge is most people think about trust, and they think about it as a quality or a characteristic. Either I have it or I don't. But when we realize that trust is through the viewpoint, the perspective of a third party, always it's through the perspective of a third party, and how that third party views things is through these slivers of experience where they take small experiences with you, with your company, with your product, with your service, and they inductively make that mean more. They, they start from the specific and generalize that out. If we can start with that understanding, what that allows us to do is it allows us to literally manufacture trust. And I'm not talking about this in a manipulative way. I'm talking about this in a sincere, authentic, value-oriented way. You know, over time, they're going to have a host of, of experiences with you that is going to flesh out their, their view of you. But the critical phase for any of these relationships is early on. Early on, if you can make and keep a promise in such a way that the other party knows that you've made the promise and knows that you've delivered on the promise, you're building trust early. And so what happens, you do that once, twice, three times, and all of a sudden, you're now a person that they start with the frame of, this is a, tr a person I can trust. This is a company that I can count on. This is a, a group that I can rely upon. We're starting to manufacture it. If I get off on the wrong foot, I make a promise or don't even realize that I made the promise, but they feel that I have, and I don't deliver. Or I deliver in a way that they really aren't seeing that I've delivered, or they're not satisfied or happy with what I've delivered then I now am, in their view, from those few small experiences, someone they can't trust. And as a result, I'm now battling uphill to regain trust. It's much easier to start from the high ground and from that frame of, yes, David, you're a person that I can trust and rely on, or you're a company I can trust and rely on, and then build from that high ground. So remember, it starts off with making and keeping a promise, but doing it in a way that the other person recognizes that it's been done. Remember, trust is not something you have or you are, but trust is a judgment, an assessment, a, a way that other people view you, what you've done, your company. It's a decision that they make. And if that's the case, the good news is, is that we can master the skill set of how to make and keep promises in such a way that it works. Now, we have to be careful when we think about making a promise we talk to somebody and they say, I want or I need, and they say X, Y, and Z. You know, if I'm a builder and I'm talking to a, a person and I'm going to do a remodel in the kitchen, they might say, you know, I'm looking for, I want all modern appliances and I like this type of design aesthetic. 
Those are the things they say they want, and that's true. But what they might not know to say, or they might never have articulated, because they think it's an understood thing, is they might have some other needs. Like, hey, we can't go over a certain budget threshold because I, I just can't afford to go more. Or, hey, my big concern is I've got to live in this house while this is going on, so it's got to be done fast, such that it's minimal disruptions. Or we've got to keep the mess and the noise to be during the day while everyone's at work and, and not spilling over. Or I might have a whole host of other concerns or needs that are, we'll call this the underground, that my job in this relationship is the, that, that I, can, I can be a person of immense value where opportunities will flow to me more and more if I can take this underground and these, these implicit or, or hidden assumptions or phantom deliverables and I can bring them to the level of explicit. Well, actually, what's important for me is X, Y, and Z, but also A, B, and C. I need these other things as well. So part of being skilled to navigate accountability and being a person who can build trust in these relationships is being able to pull what's underground and make it explicit. Also, sometimes you're on the other side. You might be the, the customer trying to get your kitchen remodeled. How you pull forward and, and express what your concerns are and understand what you would expect from the other person and articulate and verbalize that and make sure you get agreement and tying down agreements of what your expectation should be. Really, really hugely important. So when you think about trust, trust is a decision that someone else makes about you, your company, your products and services. Um, and it always comes from their framework. If we want to be trusted by a person, we always have to recognize that they are the ultimate person who gets to decide if we, in their view, are in fact trustworthy. If we are in fact a company, a product, service, brand that they can trust. We, we can't just say, well, of course you need to trust us because we're honest. It's not about that. It's a decision that someone else makes about you. We influence that. We can, can harness that, but ultimately we don't get to control that. That's the other person. And by the same token, at the same time that they're judging us, we're also judging them. Are they reliable? Are they a reliable employee? Are they a reliable strategic partner? Are they a reliable, uh, reliable trustworthy supplier, customer? Are they going to pay their bills? The key part is if we only take care of what they explicitly say, we're clumsy. By the way, it's a good thing. Right? You know, when you think about it, most people, they don't take care of a really they're, they're mixed whether or not they actually do the deliverable. Now, if you can go to another level higher and consistently deliver on what you've quote unquote promised, that's good. But sometimes though, whether you say it's fairly or unfairly, the other party has hidden needs that you just checking off that I've, I've delivered what's in the contract can still leave them unsatisfied. And so the highest level, playing the highest level, is where you not only just satisfy the specific things that you promise to do, but you've taken care of the underlying need, right? You've, you've taken care of what, we'll call it the job to be done, and I'll explain this in a moment. Um, and when you do that, that's when you're putting happiness and thrilled and the relationship and trust on steroids. I mean, it just does so much. So let me talk for a moment about something we call the job to be done. Please write this down in your, in your notes. I'm hoping that as you listen to this podcast or watch it, that you do take notes. I'm trying to give you enough value that's worth it for you to take notes about things. But the job to be done, it's a term that comes from a guy by the name of Clayton Christensen, is the person at least who I learned this from. Clayton Christensen is a business executive who started, built a $100 million company, then he became a, a professor. At the time I first started reading his stuff, he was a professor at Harvard Business School. And he had a book called, that I still think is a fantastic read. I strongly encourage you to read it. It's called, How Will You Measure Your Life? It's a fantastic book. One small chapter in there, he talked about the job to be done. And let me describe what this is. So I'm going to do a couple of examples. I'll start with a really very basic example, and then we're going to build, and we're going to actually do the rest of this episode of this podcast with a complicated business relationship case study. I'm going to share with you about Acme, Inc., who's an actual client of ours. I have changed the identifying information. I got their permission. Um, but I want to share with you an actual one. They're an engineering manufacturer who build widgets. We'll call them widgets and have a 
serious uh, line of widgets that are really quite technologically amazing. Now they sell through a strategic partner, a platform company who we'll call Platform LLC. And managing that 20 plus year relationship is complicated and, and difficult and they need to up their game. And I'm going to go through how to use this accountability loop in that, in that context. But the job to be done, you know, before I came in to do this recording today for the podcast, which is in a conference room right next to my main office, I've, we've created it and built the lighting in and the staging in, the whiteboard that you see me drawing all over, that's would be a little bit more fun. Um, at the same time, so yesterday I said to my assistant, I asked her, I said, hey, just a reminder, Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be doing uh, two episodes of the podcast, recording them back to back. Now, I've asked her when that happens that there's certain things that she needs to do. Make sure the lighting is set up. Make sure the cameras are there. So some of those things are explicit, including things like, hey, um, for the microphone that I'm going to be using, always change out and give me a fresh battery. You only need to have it happen once where you go to record and all of a sudden the audio cuts out 30 minutes into an hour podcast and you're like, oh, that was good stuff. I have to go generate all that energy and record it again. Now, what I didn't explicitly say, though, was I like the conference room where I'm recording to have fewer distractions. And so if I look around the conference room, I came in, there were a lot of boxes for some of the AV equipment we just upgraded, went to a second camera and did some things and a new mixer box and different things where there's boxes on the conference room table at the other side. Now, you can't see that right now, but I came in this morning. I'm like, hmm, I, was, I wasn't upset. But to my mind, my assistant didn't deliver satisfaction to me. She did check off the boxes of the things I explicitly asked her in our standard you know, checklist process for how to get the room ready for that. But one of my underlying needs I realized that I need to communicate with her is I need this room to be zenned up. I need it to look clean, not cluttered, so I don't have distractions pulling away some of my attention. Now, she didn't ask me about that part of it, and I didn't tell her. So I'm, it's not necessarily where it's fair for me to say that, but I make a determination about how much I can trust her to, to satisfy or to solve for what my needs are. She did certain things real well. That's good. right? She hit the explicit ones I asked for, but I had a phantom deliverable that I never made explicit. She never unveiled that, took the underground stuff and made it above ground, and I as a client of hers, a customer of hers, never explicitly voiced it because I didn't realize it until after I saw it not done the way I needed it to. And as a result, she did produce some satisfaction, but she didn't produce deep satisfaction or that real trust that she could have, right? Again, I'm not putting blame to it. I'm just neutrally observing that that went on for me. And the same thing is going on by the people you work with day in, day out about you, and you're making the same determinations about them. When we can become graceful about how to make this explicit, to be skilled whether we're the one producing, making the promise, keeping the promise, or we're the one receiving the promise and making sure that we're thrilled when it's done, this is a really important business skill. It is perhaps in many ways the business skill. All right, so building on from here, um, the job to be done. So that was an example. Here's another one, a home builder. Let's go back to somebody who's doing a kitchen remodel. You know, we can specify out the scope of work. You know, it's going to have these types of appliances, a new range, you know, a Viking uh, uh, range, and it's going to have these sub-zero refrigerators and a separate wine uh, refrigerator, and it's going to have one sink over here, a second um, prep sink over here. It's going to have, we can spell out all those parts. But if the builder produces all those things, checks all the boxes, but never understood that part of my need was how to minimize the disruption of my life of this builder coming in and remodeling the kitchen. He never managed that part of it. I might be satisfied with some parts, but I'm dissatisfied in others, and that hurts how I feel about that builder and hurts me referring more business to them and uh, you know, probably leaves me a little dissatisfied, and I might be a little bit more demanding toward the end. Now, you could say, is that fair of me? I don't know. Right? Fairness isn't, a, isn't an issue here, but it, this is how human beings are wired and work. A skilled producer, a skilled builder would have recognized that the job to be done wasn't just to, to do the kitchen, but the job to be done was to give me back my home as quickly as possible with minimum disruption so I can get on with enjoying my life and enjoying my home, my place of peace um, from that part. That was part of the job to be done. And a skilled producer has to 
elicit from the other party what really is the job to be done. And so we're going to come back here again to this example of Acme Inc. in just a moment. So when we talk about business relationships over time, we have those initial promises being made. But when we can not just satisfy what we've explicitly agreed to, but we can dive deeper to know what's really, what's the result that really matters and why is it important to the other party, and we can produce that, now we go to this much higher level. And when we do that consistently in the community, in a business niche, we become, uh, we create a, a reputation or a company creates a brand such that opportunity flows. Um, we now can charge more pricing wise and, and can, can, can cultivate better customers or better clients. We can dominate a niche because we've earned the reputation of being a company, a product, of individual that people can trust and rely on. It's a big, big deal. So we need to get very good about how do we make promises? How do we elicit what really is the underlying needs, desires, and concerns so we don't just deliver on promises, but we make better promises that we deliver on? We have to learn how to be a person who knows how to be a receiver of these things, like the, to be the person who's receiving this work, a customer or a client ourselves, and how to get our needs stated, but also to understand the other person's side, such that we can be a better consumer of their product or service. And when we do these things, this loop, which we'll, call, we'll talk about this four-step loop, what it allows us to do is it allows us to produce at a higher level. It gets us results where we receive at a, the best of someone he has to offer because of how we manage that. How do we navigate this over time? So what I want to do is I want to go through what this accountability loop looks like. Um, once we're done going through the accountability loop, what I want to do is then I want to give you a set of skills. We call these micro skills. Because here's the best part. I'm not just going to tell you that you need to build trust to make your business relationships work over time, especially if they're complicated long-term business relationships. That is so unhelpful. <laughs> That's maddening. Telling me what I need to do without giving me the concrete steps how to do it would drive me crazy. It's a pet peeve of mine. So I'm going to go through the accountability loop. I'm going to train you on how you can do it better. And then I'm going to give you a body of skills. I'm going to make them explicit that you can practice one at a time. Practice a skill for the, the next 90 days. Then practice the next micro skill over the next 90 days. And you do this over time. You'll be building in layer by layer by layer the skill of how to become a person in your marketplace and a company with a culture of trust, a company with a, a reputation in your business niche. So let's start off by talking about this accountability accountability loop. So there are four steps with the accountability loop. Step number one of the accountability loop um, is we call this understanding the real needs. Understanding the real needs. Now notice I say not just needs but the real needs. Now in this process there's going to be two parties. We're going to simplify this. Some relationships, there are more than two parties, but we're going to pretend there's two parties. The, what we're going to call these two parties is we're going to have the person who produces the work. So we'll call that the producer. And we're also going to have the secondary person to that, which we'll call the client or the customer. Now, if you are selling to an actual client, you're producing for the client. But inside your company, you have producers and clients. For example, um, Rich Wood runs our coaching program. He's our coaching director. He's fantastic. From time to time, he asks me to con contribute a piece for our coaching team. Like, for example, later this week, uh, I'm doing a special training for, I think, seven or eight of our coaches. And so I'm the producer, and the coaches and Rich that will be part of that training, they are my client or my customer. I'm promising to produce a certain result for them. So you're both in your life. You, you need to be a skilled producer, the person who makes promises, produces, and delivers promises. And you also need to be a skilled consumer of promises, a skilled client of persons making promises or companies making promises. You need to do both. So we're making that distinction here. I'm, giving, I'm putting language to something that's just you've been doing for years without any type of precision, 
and without necessarily having a language or a, a structure for how to do that. So understanding real needs. This is, this is me knowing from the other party what matters to them. Like what is their need and why does it matter? And then I also have to know about what are the things I need from this um, interaction and why does it matter? So for example, if I'm the producer and I'm selling to some other company about we're going to come in and coach four of their executive team and the owner, I know some of our needs would include that we have a client who's going to be coachable, that they're going to be willing to go the long term because much of the value of coaching happens not just in the first you know, 90 days of coaching, but you start having results at the 6, 12 month mark that in year 3 and year 5, you're compounding the results so they go much steeper over time. Those are some of our needs. Now the other client says, well, I need to make sure that I get a good ROI, a good return on investment within 6 or 12 months so that it's producing more than what it's costing, that it's becoming a, a, a source of strategic profit for us. Um, I'm needing to make sure that I get a good structure, that someone's going to hold me accountable. I'm needing, that's a whole body of concerns that they have. So at the understanding real needs stage is before I go into that interaction to have that relationship with the other party, I should just pause. What is it that my needs are from this interaction? And what do I think their needs are and why? And then I should be also willing to talk with them about that early on. This is early on. And, and from here, your goal from understanding needs is to, dis, is to, to qualify enough to know, should you make a promise? Should you make an offer, right? So at this stage right here, understanding real needs, you're either going to stop at this point realizing that we shouldn't be doing business together or we shouldn't be doing that next step together or what more likely is going to be the case that you discover, in fact, to step two, you progress to step two, which is clarifying and negotiating needs, deliverables, and terms. So step one is to understand what are the real needs going on here. And, and, and I'll tell you that you will generate amazing trust in your long-term relationships in the business world when you're willing to see what you can and cannot produce, when you're willing to see what, what you can be successful doing and what you really can't, whether you don't have the, the capability to do it or the resources to do it uh, or the time to do it or the attention. And letting the other party know up front versus saying, yes, I'll do this, but then not delivering. I'd rather disappoint up front by being straight with somebody, by understanding when you go through real needs, that it, it just it doesn't fit for you. Either you don't have the ability or the resources to produce, or you don't see how it really fits your needs to work with that person or that company at that time. And that's perfectly appropriate if you say it up front. So the accountability loop starts with understanding needs, and it goes to clarifying and negotiating needs deliverables and terms. This is where we're spelling out from the other person. Hey, tell me, for, and we'll use the example here of, of Acme Inc. So Acme Inc. has, um, they're a company that manufactures technical widgets. We'll call it that. And when they design these widgets and build them, they might have a million dollars or more of development cost to come up with a new line of widgets. And then platform company sells those widgets through to its large customer base and it's a, it's a sales channel. Now, platform company sells Acme stuff, but it also sells probably 50 or 100 other manufacturer stuff on their platform. Now, needs of, of Acme as they design these things are, we need to, to make sure that we have a path to profitability for every product that we build. We're going to have to make sure that we're going to reach profitability in any reasonable frame to get return on the million dollars of development costs we have to put in before we receive money back. We're going to need to make sure that we have a commitment from the other party um, that they're going to promote our stuff, if we're going to develop it for them, that they're going to promote it and sell it in, an, in enough volume and at a certain price point with a certain margin such that we can have a path to profitability. Now, that was the explicit part of what they had. When they started clarifying and negotiating needs and deliverables, what they also realized was they had an issue where Acme would create a new widget and they would deliver the widget to platform company and platform company would say this is good but we need to test it out more about this and this and really we need to have better performance on this. They would, 
they would change the goal line after the delivery had happened. And Acme, the, the company, our client, was not realizing that this was going on or not knowing what to do about it. We'll come back to that in a moment. Just know that that's a problem. They had a need, which is for them, they had to optimize or shorten the development timeline between putting money in and actually having a product start to sell so that they would get recouping their investment and getting to profitability faster. That if they gave the product over to Platform LLC and Platform LLC made them go and do two, three, four, six, twelve 12 more months worth of work to add features or tighten up functionality, that that was a form of scope creep. You remember from the last episode of the podcast and that scope creep was killing them or hurting them deeply, mostly in terms of, op uh, of, of, of cash flow uh, and also in terms of opportunity cost. You know, waiting seven or eight months before they started selling a product that was ready to go to market, they lost seven or eight months worth of revenue. So when you get from understanding what it leads to clarifying and negotiating through what both parties are going to agree to be doing here, part of what we have to do is we have to take what's underground and make it explicit. Skilled people get good about eliciting other companies' real needs or other parties' real needs, especially in long-term complicated relationships. So we also have to get good about what does platform need, right? Platform has a body of needs that they have with this part, you know, and you think about it. So here we have Acme. You know, 90% of their sales are through this one sales channel. It matters to them greatly. But they've been doing this for over a decade, but, but they really did it more informally. They hadn't put any precision to how they're working together. And if for some reason there's a delay in the release of a product, Acme is the one who bears the cost. They're the ones that has all that cash, a million dollars or more, tied into a product. And if it's delayed by 12 months, they're the one who's basically covering the cost from that. Now, their old way of doing this would be simply to sit down with Acme and maybe once a year or every two years, they would sit down and do a product review meeting with this platform company. And they would agree on a, a, a series of products, three, four, five products lines that they're going to be making over the next three years. Um, and then Acme would go and design and make these products based on this and would deliver it to them saying, hey, here we go. Here's the, you know, the, the Widget 1000 series. And then, then Platform LLC would then look at it and say, well, we need to test it this way and we really need it to be a little bit more like this or we need a little bit of that function and we need a little bit of this. And so now Acme would go back and try to re-engineer the thing to meet their needs and then six, 12 months later, they would fi finally start selling it. It would cost, you know, 50% more um, they'd have holding costs and the opportunity cost. It was a big deal. But they would do this meeting, they would create the product map of what they wanted to do, and they would create specifications. You know, a, a, a requirements document of this product line, the new widget 1000, needs to be able to do X and Y and Z, the specifications. But they did it in a very loose way, and, and, and because of that, when, when Acme would, would be doing the development, sending their quarterly updates to this platform company, they only found out that they didn't really take care of the underlying deeper needs of their partner after they had developed and delivered, which is too late. To make changes at that point is very expensive. Um, and it was hurting them. It was delaying launches. It was tying up cash for, for a much longer period of time, millions of dollars of that way. So step number one says we have to understand needs, not just what is stated, but the underlying why behind those needs so we can take some of the underground pieces and make them explicit. You know, for Acme, they needed to make sure that they made profit, right? That, 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 that there was a path to profit, that to develop a new product, a new widget, made financial sense, both by their expectation of how fast they would be able to start selling it, how many units they think they could, they, that the platform company would sell, and also at what price point, so what margin would Acme get? Their biggest variable that as we started to make this explicit that they didn't think about before but now became explicit as a need, one of their real needs was to optimize for how fast they could get that product developed and, and being sold in the marketplace. They had another need that they, they thought about but they never really clarified with their partner. They had a need to differentiate. You know, for example, they had, you know, the, the widget one series, and then they had the widget two series, and the widget three series, and 
they might have the 3 Series as the one that was most expensive. The, think of it as the Lexus version of that. And so here they had the Lexus version. It had all the bells and whistles, the most capabilities of the most expensive. And then they had their, their 2 Series, which might be like the, you know, if I'm a Toyota fan, I'm going to call that a, a, um, you know, a Camry, right? And then the lowest version would be their Corolla. Um, and what would happen is because they didn't make it clear that one of their needs was to make sure that they re retain a certain number of features that only are available in Lexus. If we, if we take the leather interior, if we take the, the heads-up display unit on our windshield, if we take all these wonderful functions and we put them in our Corolla, why would anyone spend the extra for the Lexus, right? So they had to make sure that each of these had clear distinctions between them so that the people who wanted price and wanted basic functionality, they wanted um, you know, good value that way, would buy the 1 Series. And the people who wanted more functionality but not the Ultra would buy the 2 Series. And the people who would want the, the most advanced would buy the 3 Series. And that's a really important thing for us to consider and think about because they needed to have clear distinctions between those such that, that selling the 1 Series doesn't pirate their 2 or 3 because that was one of their needs. But they had never made it explicit. They had hinted around it. They had brought it up. They would never really been very, very clean on that part. Um, they also needed to make sure they had a partner who didn't stall going to market, who didn't throw in lots of last-minute requests or last-minute change orders for the new product that they had developed that would delay things. That was really important. But they never again clearly articulated their need with that and negotiated through what that is. Now, what was the other person's? Their, their platform LLC had some real needs as well. They needed to have a great product that would actually sell well. In this case, every time someone bought a widget, let's say someone made an order for $10,000 of widgets, the cool part for, for the platform company is that this was a core product that would oftentimes sell through $100,000 of other products along with the sale. So when you bought this, you would buy another 100 grand of other stuff. It would not be uncommon. So one of their things was they wanted to sell more of the widgets, which means they wanted a price point that was lower because they made a lot more money selling the other products that were not Acme's. That's a little bit of a disconnect there. They have to navigate that. They need to make that explicit. They also want to make sure that, that, that it's profitable for them, which means that they want to make sure since uh, the platform company who sold it has to support it over time with the, with the technical support. That's expensive. If stuff breaks or stuff has to, is complicated and difficult to use, that was important to them. They wanted to make sure that they didn't get, you know, lose their margin by having too much after work or, or, or support work. And reputationally, they wanted to make sure that it was high quality such that when they sold the widget, that their customer who went on to spend hundreds of thousands of other dollars with them was really, really thrilled. So those were some of the underlying needs. Now, how do we negotiate and navigate those needs? It's not so easy, right? To negotiate or navigate those real needs are there. First of all, we have to understand and put them on the table. So step one says we need to put what our needs are and what their needs are on the table as clearly as we can. Step two says we now, before we go into creating the deal, we have to dig deeper into their needs and be better about expressing our needs, especially the phantom needs that were never stated. This is really important. So in step two, when we clarify, you know, they would ask questions like, tell, tell us your platform company, what products do you most want or need us to develop? Why? If we were to create this product, how else does it help you succeed selling other products? Tell me more. My understanding from what you just said is, if we create this new widget, where it creates value for you is not just the direct widget sales, but for every $1 of widget sales, your expectation is you're going to have $10 of other peripheral sales for, for cabling or other, other parts that go along with it. Got it. Um, tell me here, is there a market need today for this widget? Or do you think it's something in the future there will be a need, but there doesn't exist a need today? Oh, it's a need today. Okay. How big, if you were to put a, a number to it, how big do you think the range of, of the need is? Is this a, you know, a million dollars of sales to $10 million opportunity? Or do you see right now the market wants 50 to $100 million of these widgets right now if we had them? 
Again, we don't, but if we could wave a magic wand and produce quality widgets, how much of it would the market want today? Oh, okay, tell me more. Why do you think that that's true? Got it. So what I'm hearing you say is that, that for every year we delay doing that, there's $50 million of, of, of demand for this type of widget that goes unsatisfied. Am I hearing you correctly? Got it. And then if I'm connecting the dots, this $50 million worth of, of, of demand for widgets that goes un, unmet met right now costs you um, 10x that, so 500 million of other peripheral sales, because every time you sell widgets, you're going to have 10x more sales of this other stuff. Did I hear you correct with that? Got it. So speed to market is one of your most important needs. Did I understand that correctly? Now, you'll notice as I ask these questions, this is me being a skilled salesperson. But, you know, a skilled salesperson is also a skilled person to ask questions, to, to, to uncover and to make the invisible visible, to shape and articulate what needs are and why and cost to status quo. Remember, Acme's one of their biggest needs was speed to market. They don't want to develop this product and have the platform company pause for six months or 12 months of, of doing this little fine-tuning work that doesn't affect sales or customer satisfaction. Um, that really is more about preference and, and, and idiosyncratic preference in the market's need. Part of what we need to do is to define through where it's now in the best interest of our counterpart, of our, in this case, our client, who is our strategic partner, in this case, Platform LLC. I've got to make that explicit with that part. Um, now we can go on to talk about, well, what specifically should the product specifications be? And in the past, Acme would define this through in a very loose way. We're telling them and coaching them of how to be much, much cleaner about what that is. So first is we have to take what's invisible and make it visible. Once we clear on what everyone's needs actually are, both the stated and the implicit or unstated phantom needs, we get them on the table. And now as we negotiate through, we can now navigate what would a successful relationship or deal look like for both parties. In this case, it's a, what's the product you want us to make, right? And under what timeline? And what's your criteria of success? If we were to deliver a really solid, knock it out of the park product, how would you be evaluating that part? Getting that clean. The goal here is to, to negotiate up front what that looks like so that later on as you start to deliver on that, they don't change the game and move the goalpost later on. Well, I know we said it needed to do X and Y, but now we realize here we are a year and a half into your development part. Now we need to know we needed to do Z as well. We got to be careful about that. We have to preempt that by getting that clear. And eventually, as we craft out what the needs are and, and what the, the deal is, we need to eventually get that put down in writing. Now, am I talking just a contract? No. Although a contract probably is a good idea um, in many cases, but some of the relationships will be more informal than that. So for example, let's say that uh, you have a, a new uh, chief marketing person in your company, Debbie, and you have a certain expectation for what the results are that you're expecting from Debbie. What, Debbie, what are the resources you think you'll need to create these results? Hmm, hearing those parts. Here's some of the constraints we have. Tell me, how can you work within these constraints and still deliver on these results, right? We're going to negotiate this through, and now we're going to say, great, here's what I'm expecting over the next 6, 12 months from you and the marketing team. I'm expecting you to deliver this many leads of this quality at this cost, whatever that part is. You're going to, you're going to lay out that, and it might just be a, a recap email of what we've agreed you're going to be doing, the plan that you're going to be doing it with, and how you'll be checking in over time, right? That, that could be an internal customer or an internal client, how we do that part. In our example from Acme, it's going to probably take the form of, um, if not a formal written contract, certainly about uh, here's the product brief that we're creating a development memorandum of here's the product, the widget we're going to develop, and here's why you think it's important from your end. Here's what your needs are. Here's what our needs are, which would include things like not stalling it on the other side that when we know we're ready to, to, on our part to actually have inventory in, in hand to sell on March 1st, we need to make sure that you guys have the launch for that all organized so that on, you know, on, on March 1st or on February 15th, we start 
um, with the promotion and that you're going to place your first stocking order uh, perhaps uh, on March 1 and maybe they start the promotion then you agree on April 1st. But you want to agree to nail those parts with that. Part of navigating this also is, hey, for us to produce this widget for you and with these specifications, here's what we need from you. So the example of our marketer, hey, Debbie might say to, to, say to me, say, David, if you want me to generate these results, here's what I'm going to be needing. We're going to need to be working with an outside um, pay-per-click and uh, uh, online marketing company that we'll, we'll, we'll look for for a vendor. Budget, I would imagine, for that will be somewhere between six and $7,000 a month um, initially, but we'll probably be scaling that as we have ROI. That might be as much as twenty dollars or $30,000 a month, ultimately with the ad buy for what we're trying to accomplish. Right? So Debbie gets to share with you what her needs are for me to accomplish what I want. So in this case, it might be things like, hey, we need to have certain updates along the way that if you notice where there's a change or a shift in the market about what they want from their widget, you need to communicate with that with us quickly before we put too much resources into developing this part. You know, for us to produce this, we might need a design clarification, a couple of drill down meetings with you that, hey, for the, you know, we might need three meetings over the next 90 days to really nail the specifications and what the design brief looks like for this new product. And then we're going to need to have a quarterly meeting to go through. We can give updates and progress, but also hear back from you about um, your feedback along the way to make sure that we're, we're, we really are going to create a solution that's going to thrill you in the end. And then when we do deliver to you and we give you the heads up that, hey, we're, you know, we're 120 days out from having inventory in hand, we're going to need to make sure that you guys have your, your, your launch plan all in place so that you launch quickly that we can get off for sales early. When we're done with this part, we need to have a, a check. Hey, if we deliver all of this on our side the way we've talked about here, are you going to be thrilled on your end? I want you to imagine it's one year from today. We've delivered what's in here. Has this solved what you really want from us? Has it given you a way that you feel really, truly happy and thrilled with what we've delivered, assuming we've met what's in here, right? I'm tying that down. If there's any kind of hesitancy on their part, ask them, hey, well, what else, what's missing from here that if we don't produce that as well, you're not going to be thrilled? Got it. Now, that might change you having to negotiate um, timeline of expectations. It, you might have to also say that we can't do something and make sure you clarify that up front. You might have to change pricing if it's a different type of business relationship. But you want to take those unstated things and you want to make sure you have one last chance to clarify what they are. So that's step two. Step three is where you're producing and delivery. Step three is produce and deliver. Now, here's the key part about when you produce and deliver. You're actually going to be fine-tuning expectations. Hey, here's where we stand on price and terms. Here's where we stand on timeline. How is it going? Is it working from your end? Great. And, and, and we're going to have to be navigating and consistently checking in with our client or whoever, whoever that is, internally or externally. In this case, it's platform LLC. We're going to be checking in on a regular basis to have communicating needs back and forth. This negotiation of needs, deliverables, and terms doesn't happen once up front and then you're done. You're consistently going back to that as if you're dancing with them. That might be on a weekly basis. That might be on a monthly basis. In our example for Acme, it's probably more of a quarterly basis with interim things if something big comes up. So for example, if I'm Acme and we're making this widget, and we thought we could get our core processor at, you know, at uh, $50 per unit. But it turns out that there's been a massive issue with the supply chain, and that price just went up and doubled to $100 per unit, which means we're going to have to change the end price for the widget. I don't want to wait to the end. I might discover that somewhere in the, in the you know, maybe it's four months, five months into that process, and I bring that up. Hey, platform, here's what we've just discovered. The core processor we need to build with that widget with, it went from a, a $50 unit cost to a $100 unit cost. We cannot produce this at the current part that we thought we could do. It's going to have to increase by another $50 or more to pass that on. 
can, can you guys do that? Will that work for you? And if it doesn't, I'd rather find out early enough to kill that project. Again, these are long-term relationships. It's not a one-off. You might say, well, David, what if the other party doesn't care about it? He said, hey, you said you could do that. Well, now what we've learned is we have to make sure that here's the set of assumptions under which we can do that. Currently, here's what the pricing for the core processor is. Here's what our current cost for these other supply components. Assuming that stays the same, this is what we can do. If the market changes on that and those costs go up, obviously we're going to have to adjust pricing on that part and we're going to have to price it through to the end consumer with that part. And then they might come back to you and say, you know what, we can raise the pricing by you know, $60 per unit cost to account for that, but I know you're wanting $75 of an increase per unit cost to have a little bit of a buffer. We don't think the market's going to accept that. And now you can negotiate. Hmm. Well, if we could cut out these two functionality pieces, get rid of from two ports um, down to one port or from four down to two ports or something, would that work, right? You can negotiate how can we still hit their real needs of a great product that they can market that will then lead to more follow-on sales for them and yet still be profitable for us. This dance of produce and deliver, the big mistake that most people make is they skip it and they produce and deliver in isolation and they're looking for the, what I call the big ta-da. It's like, okay, this is what you want from me. Let me go away in my little cave. Let me produce this for you and come back with a big reveal moment. Ta-da. And the companies or the individuals that do the ta-da invariably blow trust. Why? Because stuff gets in the way that their ta-da is never quite what they think it's going to be. There's, there's needs that never were elicited early on that if they had done this with partially along the way progress reveals, progress reveals where there's good communication back and forth, this would be an upward spiral so that when they finally do deliver, people are thrilled. And along the way, you've tied down, does this work for you? Is this going to be successful for you if we do it this way? Here's what we're needing. Can you make that work? You're tying things down as you go so that when you finally produce and deliver, it's not a risky moment. There have been a hundred other touch points along the way or 10 other touch points along the way so that you've manufactured thrilled customer or thrilled client, thrilled receiver along the way versus this big reveal moment. The people who do the big reveal moment, they like the, the burst of energy, but it's, it's, it's invariably a risky way to go. Sometimes it does work, but it's risky. And oftentimes you think you've delivered, but the other person is not satisfied. And I would make that a really important point. Now, as you've clarified in writing, you've recapped, this is your chance to align expectations. And then as you produce and deliver, new information will come up. Again, we're talking about this accountability loop in complicated business relationships. In complicated business relationships, you, you rarely have all the information up front. You learn new things as you go. Or that there are things that you didn't really think about up front that you discover as you actually live into this agreement to produce and deliver. And so by making that an ongoing dance back and forth where there's communication both ways, what that does is you're manufacturing, you're producing a thrilled end result along the way versus waiting to the end. My experience has been such that the other party is probably not skilled at this. Rarely do I find people who are skilled at this. Now, I watch Stephanie and I marvel. She is a, 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 a premier ballerina at doing this dance. She is extraordinary at it. I think I'm pretty darn good at it. She's better. But most people, they don't really ever have, have built this skill set. And so you need to be the one driving this process in a way that doesn't feel overbearing. You need to find a graceful way to lead this process. I'll come through with some of those micro skills in a moment. But here we are, we're at the end of step three. We've produced and delivered, and most people think, aha! We're done. But you're not done. You're not done at all. You're, you've delivered something, but are you going to take chance to see if it really has satisfied the other party? You've got a fourth step to do. And the fourth step for you to do is to what we call close the accountability loop. So step one says understand the real needs of you and them. 
From there, you make the decision, should we actually enter into this business transaction, whether that's internal to your company, with a supplier, with a customer, with a strategic joint par partner or sales channel like with Acme. Step two says we're going to clarify what people's real needs are and why, what matters to them and why. We're going to clarify what is it that they want delivered and what can you produce. We're going to actually negotiate through to get to a very clear understanding of who's going to do what by when to what standard, how we're going to communicate in this process, what are the underlying expectations, what are the underlying assumptions, and if it's complicated, how we'll make sure we'll negotiate or navigate that ongoing. From there, we recap it in writing and out loud such that now we have an agreement in place. We have a clear, clean promise. Now, once we have that clear, clean promise, the producer is going to have to you know, do their part, deliver that promise. But it's back and forth, back and forth along the way, communicating when new information comes up that's important to the other party to navigate expectations on timeline and deliverables and also just for status reports, hey, how are we doing? This is where we're trending. Are you happy? Right? Going back to our builder example, hey, Mrs. Jenkins, um, you know, it's now been you know, two weeks here in the construction process. How have we done? I, I, I want to make sure that we minimize dust and noise for you. you know, we thought we would be, we'd be done with the full kitchen remodel in two months. As you know, we had um, earlier this week, I've talked with you about, we had one of the issues with ordering certain materials, you know, your, your new kitchen, you know, your kitchen cook stove and so forth, they're going to be delayed by two weeks, which puts us out two weeks longer. Is there anything else you're needing from us? I want to make sure that when we deliver that you really are thrilled. How are we doing? Have we communicated it well? Right? I check in along the way. Maybe Mrs. Smith says, you know what? Yesterday your guys, I, I discovered, were smoking in the kitchen. And I know it's closed off with plastic sheeting in that part, but the smoke really just it disturbs me. I, I, I'm a non-smoker. I really don't want your guys inside. If they need to smoke, I want them outside smoking. And I would ask that they don't come back walking and carrying the smoke back in with them, that they finish smoking outside and put away the cigarette. And after a minute or two, then and only then come back in. Got it, Mrs. Jenkins. I, I didn't realize that was going on. I'll talk with our team and make sure that we fix that. I might circle back two days later. Hey, I've talked with the team. How is it going? Have they stopped doing that? Oh, they have. I'm so appreciative. Right? That's this dance of produce and deliver. It's a back and forth. But when I finally do hit that final step where I'm delivering, I need to close the accountability loop. Hey, I need to tell the other party, I'm delivering what I promised to you. Here it is, as promised. And then I need to check in with them of saying, hey, I know along the way we've been talking about it, but I want to make sure, are you happy with what I'm delivering? One way of asking that question indirectly at the end is to say, hey, Mrs. Jenkins, I'm so glad you, you like what we've delivered. Let me just ask a question differently. Um, did we not just meet your expectations, but actually delight you in such that, here's the easiest way to know, if you were redoing this project all over again, would you come straight to us to do the project? In other words, did we do well enough on our promises and our delivery that you would come straight to us to do the project all over again? And if her answer is anything other than absolutely, I need to go in there and say, well, wh where did we miss the mark? Tell me more about that. Hmm. Okay, and that might be that you might need to deliver more, or you might have to negotiate back through and navigate what expectations were. As we talked about before, you know, we had said that, that you know, I had mentioned to you before that you probably were going to want the second sink. And so we can have a triangle between your stovetop, the sink, and the refrigerator. The way you had it laid out, I had shared with you along the way, on four occasions about that. So if you do want, we can cut in and put a new sink in here. It, it will be more expensive to do now, but along the way we've talked about that on four, four occasions you told me that you did not want to do that. Um, right? So I can now use what we've done before to tie that back down, because sometimes they might want something that's unrealistic. Um, it just can't be done, whether they're just ignorant of what the, the, the needs are with that. But I've got to close the loop with that part. So going back in here with our example of Acme, let's use that as another example here. So I produced, uh, I've delivered, and now I got to go back to platform. Hey, here's the final product. As you know, you know, we told you 60 days ago that we would be ready to deliver. We have inventory now. We're all set to go. Or here's the prototype for that part. Um, our criteria of success said we were going to have this functionality. It meets or exceeds all that functionality. How did we do, right? I want to make sure, is this something that you guys are now happy with that you're going to go and promote and sell the heck out of? Because not only does it help 
um, us, but it also helps you not just sell that, but sell all these other follow-on um, items and so forth sold through. And then I can ask the question, hey, we're upping our game. We're trying to become more and more professional with how we're, we're doing. We want to be one of your very best um, suppliers for this part. We want to be really a strategic partner in all these parts. And as we've upped our game, I just want to ask you, you know, did we deliver well enough such that if you had the same product for, to make again, would you come to us first to make that product for you? Right? We're going to ask. And that's a really important part. Now, I want to go back to, so summarizing where we are, then I want to go back to the micro skills to do this. Step one says I've got to understand real needs. Our real needs, their real needs. Based on that, I get to make a decision. Should I or should I not take the energy and effort to actually go into negotiations to create an actual agreement about who's going to produce what? If it is good enough that I go to actually clarify and, and negotiate through needs, deliverables, and terms, I have to start by taking what's unspoken and underground and making it explicit, bringing it above ground. I do that through the skillful use of questions and through the skillful use of sharing what my needs are with my other counterpart. Um, in addition to that, now we've got to find ways to satisfy both those needs and clarify who does what by when, on what timeline, with what budget. We need to really clarify what are the terms of the deal. We need to clarify what are the expectations that other people have about when we know this deal was done. What are the conditions of satisfaction or the criteria of success for when we deliver? That when we deliver X, Y, and Z by these dates and this price point, that you're going to be thrilled. We're pre-agreeing to that. We need to also make sure that if there are other assumptions that are baked in that could be different based on a complicated thing that we comes up as we go forward, that we express, hey, we've got two major assumptions that over time we're going to discuss. One for us is raw material cost or parts cost. Uh, and the other one for this is, you know, what one of the other assumptions are is, is that when we're delivered this part, that the market demand for this type of product is going to still remain similar or even grow. And now I got to produce and deliver on what we've agreed to along the way checking in, tying down as I deliver. When new information comes, I'm going to have to navigate and negotiate. Oh, our core processor is now going to be twice as expensive. How do we negotiate that? Hey, our, we're waiting for this kitchen range. It's going to delay us by two weeks, Mrs. Jenkins. I want to make sure that you know this the day that I know this. I share with you, here's what we're doing about it. Oh, our guys are smoking in, the, in there. You know what? We'll fix that. And I will make sure not only do we fix it, but I will circle back with you in two days to make sure that that fix stayed fixed, right? This is us doing the produce and deliver part. It's not done with this big ta-da moment. It's done navigating it back and forth. And finally, when I do deliver the final, I need to make sure that they know that I've delivered it. Hey, as promised, here's me delivering it, making sure that they received it. And then based on that, are you thrilled? You know, we said that if we could do this, 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 and this, that's what you're looking for. I want to make sure, are you in fact, did I hit the real needs that you have? One way of asking that is, if we had the same project to do again, would you come to me to do it? Now, by the way, you should also be thinking about, would you go to them to take on that project or to use them again, right? So on your side, you should be thinking, would I do the same business arrangement with them again? And if I would, that's saying a lot. If not, let's learn from that. What would I change maybe at the negotiation stage? or the production delivery stage. Or maybe I would change it at the stage of understanding real needs, realizing that they're not the partner or the person that I want to work with. All right, so I know this is information dense. But when you do this well, when you negotiate and navigate gracefully through this accountability loop, starting from step one all the way to step four, you are manufacturing trust and relationships. And in long-term business relationships, especially complicated long-term business relationships, this is what lubricates that that, 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 that allows you to have someone who's thrilled. You'll generate more business from this person or better business, better behavior from the other party. So let's go to the micro skills that we have right now. So it's hard to practice the whole loop, right? You can role play it step by step inside your organization with your team members or with your business coach, probably worth doing. But one way of doing it is to break this down, and I'm going to break this down into eight micro skills for these different parts. So here's one micro. First of all, a micro skill is if the accountability loop is the great big skill, it's hard to practice it. How can I pull apart one smaller skill that I can behaviorally practice 
in a micro way. If I were a, a like my wife plays fiddle, right? For her, maybe it's how she does her fingering on the, the left hand. Or for her, it might be how she holds her bow that she's practicing, or her posture for how she does, or how to put more expressive emotion. She can practice one skill at a time. It's hard to do all of it all at once. So the first micro skill is to get very good about discerning what your needs are and putting yourself in the other person's shoes and understanding what their needs are. That's one skill. You could practice that for a month. You could practice that for 90 days. As you go into business situations where there's going to be some kind of negotiation of you know, who does what by when to what standard, whether that be with a supplier, a customer, or internally with a team member, before I go and just pause, take two minutes to write down what are my needs out of this part. Right? Going back to the example of, of, of getting this room ready for the podcast, I could be telling my assistant, I could be saying, hey, you know, my needs are to have a very clean, clear room such that there's no distractions from equipment or clutter in the way that, that, that pulls me away from focusing right there to, to be as best I can delivering the information and sharing the stories and the insights for people listening so they can grow their business and get their life back. Right? I can also ask, what's her needs in this part? Well, she needs to have some clarity about what my expectations are. She might need me to show her what a clean room looks like. She might need me to go through and, 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 and show her why when something's not the right way, getting her up front to face the camera to say, can you see how that would be distracting? So that she has a way to see, so that she can better feel why this stuff needs to be done the right way. Second skill, um, I need to get very good at when I, this part from when I understand real needs of how to make an initial offer or make an initial request for an offer of the other party to go into negotiation of an actual deal. So here's what it might sound like. Um, with Acme, it might say, hey, I think there's an opportunity for us with a new product. Um, I think it's enough said that we should sit down. Uh, you should invite our team to come down to visit with you or send two or three of your people over to us or we set it up by Zoom, that it's worth a, an hour to an hour and a half conversation to, 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 to go deeper into exploring do, we, do you want us to make this product for the market niche? Would you like to invite us over or, or for us to invite you there, right? That's me making an offer or making a request for them to make an offer of us. That's an example. So the step of understanding needs to go into clarifying and negotiating needs, deliverables, and terms, this transition part is getting good to get the other person rooted to put aside the time to actually have this conversation. Where that might sound like might be uh, with, uh, let's say you've got a vendor of yours. Hey, I think that there's more that you could be doing for us, specifically this, this, and this. I'll put out there that if you're willing to set aside you know, 45 minutes, I would love to go through what our needs are, and then you can look at what are better ways that your company can satisfy our needs, and we can take it from there. Are you willing to set aside that time for us to meet? That's me getting good at making an offer to enter into step two. Third, um, in step two itself, I've got to get very good about uncovering what real needs are, theirs and ours. How do I take what's invisible, these phantom or below the surface um, expectations or needs, and how do I make them explicit? So at least we can navigate and deal with that in the calculus of creating a, an actual deal. Four. When we've done that, I've got to get very good at restating what they've said such that they know that I understand and I can shape their understanding by restating what they're saying better than they did in a way that I think progresses this conversation. I don't want to just parrot back what they said. I want to say back what they said. I'm hearing you say blank. And like I gave the earlier example. What I'm understanding is that one of your real needs here is that there's a $50 million plus opportunity to sell this particular type of widget to your, on your marketplace. And so getting to that need sooner is important. Speed matters to you. I'm also hearing it's not just the $50 million of widget sales that matters to you. It's the 10x, it's the $500 million of other peripheral sales that when you sell the widgets to that marketplace, there's then going to be that other demand for the other parts. Am I understanding why? Am I understanding correctly? Got it. 
So I've shaped, I've, I've not just elicited, but I've shaped their ex understanding by putting it and articulating it, putting it to words in such a way that it progresses this process. Number five, I've got to align expectations. This means I've got to be willing to have the uncomfortable conversations up front. Hey, you know, for us, the two major cost components for us are X and Y. If these change, it will change the final price point at which we can deliver each unit to you down the road. And we need to make sure that you're willing that if we do have changes from that part, and those changes are more than five or 10%, we're gonna have to pass that cost through um, to the ultimate customer. Are we, in a, are we in alignment about that, right? I need to align expectations both ways, and that usually means asking yourself, what are you scared to bring up? Oh, I'll upset them. Oh, I'll chase them away. And I wanna bring that up in that conversation, maybe not at the very start, but, but somewhere in the mid part of this, I need to say, here's some of the expectations that we would have. Are these reasonable for us to expect that, right? How about for you? What are the things you haven't shared that would be important to you that I, I just haven't asked you the right way to, to, to bring that to the surface, right? We need to align expectations. So what I'm hearing is you're wanting this, this, and this from us. And, and this is what it looks like. Successfully us delivering looks like this. Got it. Is there anything else you would want that, that if we deliver it like this, then you would be happy and thrilled and, and you, would, you, know, you would do business with us again and again and again? Got it. Here's what our expectations are. We're going to need this type of information from you in this way. We're going to need you to set aside this type of time or resources for us to deliver what we need to for you. We need this type of access to this type of information, or et cetera. Are those realistic expectations? Are, are we good to expect that from you, and can you do that and deliver that on your side? We need to get that clear on writing, which is the next micro skill, putting it down in a summary version so that you can, whether it's a formal contract or informally, even just a memorandum of understanding, it really is important. Even a follow-up clarif clarifying um, summary email. Hey, here's what I took from our meeting today. Really important. Next, number six, you need to have the self-awareness to know when you can't meet their expectations and tell them up front. There's a famous story about this, about how um, when someone would go to, you know, to Marshall's Fields in Chicago in a store and they wanted to buy something. A salesperson said, you know what, you really would do better to get it from Gimbal's for this particular need that you have. Can you imagine the trust when you can tell someone, hey, we can't deliver what you want the way you want it to in this. Either we don't have the staff or the resources or time or, or, or it just doesn't fit for us what we're looking to do. If I can tell that person up front about it, although it might be disappointing to them, what you've done is you've manufactured more trust because they know that they can count on you to tell them when you need to deliver bad news or deliver to tell them when you can't do something. As opposed to way too many people in the business world don't want to upset somebody, so what do they do? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can do that. And then they don't deliver. When would you rather find somebody can't do something? After three months into the process and you're expecting something? Or would you rather them tell you up front when they can't deliver what you want? That's another way you build trust. Number seven, how to gracefully and effectively check back in along the way when new information comes up where about where expectations have changed or, or something's come up or even just about status or progress, how are we doing? Checking in both ways. The ability to gracefully navigate that is a hugely important skill that you could practice that for, for the next 90 days and get good at even just that part would make a big difference. And finally, number eight, this micro skill of how are you closing the loop? On the most superficial way, it might be you know, the next time um, a team member says, hey, I can't find the, Stan the, the Stanislav contract. Can you get it to me? And I say, sure, I'll get it to you. I can be better about that and saying, hey, as I promised you yesterday, I said I would get it to you by the end of business today. Here's me delivering the Stanislav contract. And you know, maybe, I, I, if you were to look at my, my emails, my sent folder, you would see many times I will say, hey, Teresa, as promised, here is X. By adding that language of as promised or some version of that, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're checking and saying, hey, this is me delivering what I promised. If it's more complicated, I need to not just say, hey, this is me delivering what's promised, but I need to check in, hey, this is me delivering what's promised. My understanding is you wanted us to do these things. I think we've done that. Can I just check in with you? Are you, I, I wanna make sure you're happy and thrilled. 
Can you just check in with that? Did, it, did, it, did this take care of what you wanted? Is this result, is this product what you wanted? Product being steps that you've taken or a literal physical widget, if that's the case. The real test, if you've closed the loop successfully and done this process, is would they do business with you again for this need? And it doesn't mean that you always are going to be successful. This is an aspiration part of it, this accountability loop. The more complicated, the more expensive the, the interaction or project promises that you're doing, the scope of promises, the more detail and time you need to spend with these things. The less stakes are there, the more you can go through and abridge versions of these steps. But it's still important for you to get good at thinking about these steps distinctly. And what it will do is it'll train your brain and your behavior such that you will deliver trust to the other party. You'll manufacture a trust in that relationship. And when you do this, you're going to find customers coming to you for more opportunities, giving you more referrals, suppliers who give you better pricing in terms because they want to do business with you, strategic partners who say, let's invest more in this relationship, team members who stay with you longer. You get better performance. And when you behave this, when you model this with your team internally, then they start to model it with the people they manage and with their outside customers, suppliers, vendors, etc. Everybody wins. So in the last episode, we talked about scope creep. This is a skill set that not only helps you combat scope creep, if you haven't listened to that episode or seen it, please go back to it. But more than that, it helps you to navigate gracefully with impact and effectiveness long-term complicated business relationships by creating what we call a culture of accountability and trust. Good luck to you.